then I um, talked right at the beginning of this uh, talk on ethics and so it seems to me uh, that any really valuable and viable approach to ethics nowadays would need um, the following things and listed seven or eight sort of items of a wish list and uh, sort of been following through that thread through through this whole talk and uh, uh, mentioned ontology and epistemology as one of the more considerations of uh, around ontology and epistemology explorations around ontology and epistemology so I've already in this talk in the parts of this talk uh, um, woven in questions of epistemology epist and, and ontology and ideas and uh, possible new ways of thinking um, about ontology epistemology and uh, how that might be worked into older ideas to adapt them, modify them, open them out in a different way, allow them to deliver something uh, than th that they otherwise would not be able to deliver to us today, etc. Um, of course, I've talked a lot and written about ontology and, uh, and talked a lot about it in previous talks, and some of uh, Sila and Sol was also devoted to ontology and epistemology regarding ethics, regarding values and virtues and all, all that. So nowadays in our postmodern uh, culture, or culture of postmodernity, um, you know, most m most sort of <clears throat> most people who think about these kinds of things, I think, like philosophers, would probably tend to um, agree that ontology. It, 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 that it's impossible to come to conclusions uh, around ontology. Um, that it's kind of intrinsically inconclusive subject. But as I've pointed out uh, several times now here and elsewhere, ontology and epistemology are inevitable to our lives, to living our lives, to making choices in our lives, and they're also inevitable to any moment of consciousness, I would say, that we're always making ontological and epistemological um, uh, assessments and judgments about what we sense, what, uh, what we experience. And I've also said, so we can't really avoid it. It's there anyway, and it's having an effect anyway. Ontology and epistemology are there anyway, in any moment of our consciousness. Certainly there in our life, certainly there in regard to our practice, our Dharma practice. Certainly there in regard to um, ethics in some way or another. And they're unavoidable, they're having an effect. They affect everything. They affect what we choose, they affect how we think, they affect our orientations. And the question is, or a question then becomes, um, always, always this question is like, well, n what does the ontology and what does the epistemology that I am holding right now lead to? What does the ontology and epistemology that goes with my, underpins my Dharma practice, what does it lead to? What does it open? What does it close? What does it bring? What does it deliver? And the same thing for soul-making Dharma practice, etc. In soul-making Dharma practice, we can entertain different ontologies and epistemology, but always this question, what, what does it bring? Which is a different question it's related, but it's a different question than just, is it true? 
So we can have um, different attitudes and orientations to ontology. Indeed, we do, of course. Um, and there's a whole range there. I think in this talk, what I really want to do is, um, in a way, not in terms of my aims, and the scope of this talk is not too different from what I've done in the past, which is, I guess, three things, really. One is uh, just bring to light and mull over and discuss um, things, ontological um, questions and issues and epistemological questions and issues that we need to consider, that we need to at least acknowledge and realise and just to bring them to light and uh, acknowledge and realize them, see that they're in the picture and discuss them a little bit. Second thing is to, so to speak, elbow enough room philosophically from entrenched and usually unquestioned ontological and epistemological assumptions. So just people tend to believe, or we as human beings tend to just uh, believe this or that about what's real or about what constitutes valid knowledge. And after many years of modern philosophy and dharma and modern physics, etc., a lot of that is, is no longer actually tenable as true. A lot of those old assumptions, those entrenched ontological and assumptions, epistemological assumptions, they're not really viable. So that's the second kind of aim, to elbow enough room and uh, enough space to be creative and to discover within, to see is there other ways, uh, other ways forward, but also what might, what might just be allowed because of that space, so that something is not being illegitimately strangled out illegitimately prevented from uh, taking taking a viable place in our life, in our consciousness, in our practice, in our view. So that's the second thing, just to elbow enough space. And the third is, uh, yes, to offer uh, lightly um, possible alternative ontologies and epistemologies. Um, but I do say lightly, because this elbowing of enough room, the second kind of aim, and this third aim of offering uh, possible alternative ontology and epistemology, doesn't equate to uh, an assertion of any definite ontology or epistemology. But just just doing enough that we can move forward, create, discover. Uh, ontologies, epistemologies, attitudes um, that uh, allow us to uh, move forward, create and discover with regard to values, with regard to ethics, with regard to soul making. That means with regard to our lives and what's really important in our lives. So, uh, let's let's start with uh, a few considerations. Um, if we take uh, Buddha Dharma, and especially Pali Canon Buddha Dharma, the sense, the reading I have there is really that virtues and values, whatever you might call them, um, they have karmic effects. I'm not, not even talking about future lives, I'm talking about in, in this life, they affect the chitta, the tenor of the chitta, the quality of the chitta, the perception of self and other, all that. And that's what's important. So, uh, the ontology is just that much ontology. Well, they have karmic effects, and that's what's important. Pali Canon Buddhism, for Theravada Buddhism, as it's, as it's most usually read. In the Mahayana, there's, a, there's much more emphasis on the emptiness of phenomena, 
So including the emptiness of qualities of the chitta, including the emptiness of values and virtues and all that. And talk about the two truths, the ultimate truth of the emptiness of these things, and the conventional truth of their uh, relative uh, reality. The ultimate truth, relative truth, or conventional truth, conventional reality. And uh, and as far as, so they are empty, and there's, there's uh, values, virtues, all the rest of it, um, completely empty. It's emphasized and acknowledged and taught and studied. But at the same time, at a, the level of relative truth, the level of conventional reality, they function. They function. As I said, there is a karmic uh, effects from uh, the different values or virtues or vices or disvalues, etc. So that the emptiness is, is in a way not so much an issue. The ontological fact of the emptiness of virtues and uh, virtuous qualities of, of, of the chitta is not so much an issue. In the Vajrayana, uh, again, there's a huge emphasis on the emptiness of these things. There also seems to be this, uh, in tantric texts and Vajrayana, teaching, Vajrayana teachings, this, this depiction or teaching of a kind of encouragement to transgress against what is valuable and what is uh, virtuous, etc., and that's a complicated subject, but oftentimes the commentaries, or uh, most usually the commentaries, um, explain that that transgression is really symbolic. That, it, that to kill your mother and father means so and so. Uh, it doesn't mean literally to kill your mother and father. Mother and father symbolize this, and killing them symbolizes that. So just like in the um, well, certainly in, in uh, Pali Canon and Mahayana Buddhism, we, we, we could say the same from a soul, from soul making down perspective. We could say or think uh, similarly. Just what is the effect of values and virtues? What's the effect of uh, relating to them, taking them seriously? And what is the effect of ignoring them? of just considering them empty. So that's the important question. But actually that question is not quite uh, put precisely enough because the effect of virtues and values, you've been following everything we've been saying in this talk, the effect depends on the conceptual framework of them and depends also on my relationship to them. Am I allowed and to what extent am I allowed an erotic relationship with values and virtues? And what is my conceptual framework? And does that conceptual framework give them a, di- a, a, a rooting in another dimension, etc.? So we could, actually, if we go further a little bit further with this, we could um, <clears throat> break down broadly the ontological um, approach in Buddha Dharma not quite so clean cut, but let's say to two attitudes. One is um, just the when you get in Pali Canon Buddhism, or as it's most commonly read, uh, and certainly as it's read through the Abhidhamma, for instance, in Theravada, uh, is the virtues and the values. These are real things. The virtues certainly are real things, and or they are real component components of a mind moment. So Abhidhamma, um, usually what what it does is really categorize a whole, uh, you know, a number. It actually gives, there are these many uh, qualities of mind. These are the possible qualities of mind of any mind moment, and it lists them, and there's a certain number. And it's this number and not another number. So Abhidhamma categorizes the number, a number of, or the number of possible uh, um, qualities of a mind moment. But there, in the Abhidhamma, the moment and its uh, mental qualities are viewed as real. They're viewed as inherent, inherently existent. And it was this view of inherent existence uh, that 
to which Nagarjuna objected. And, and a lot of his his texts are really uh, polemic attacks on that kind of reified view of the reality of virtues, the reality of m- mind qualities in mind moments. But our question right now is, what does such a realist view, as we find in the Abhidhamma, what does it do to our relationship with ethics and virtues and values? Because in the language that we've been using, it is, uh, it gives them reality, yes, it's great, it gives it, you know, they're deemed very important, but the whole thing is uh, conceived of in what we would call a flat way, a mechanical way, almost a cold way. These things, uh, these mind moments and these qualities do not have soft and elastic edges. There's something limited in that view and and limiting. There isn't, it does not allow or allows very little scope for eros or soul making in relationship to ethics. There's no real sense of dimensionality, of infinity, infinitude. There's no, uh, or it's quite a poor sense of the human being. We've touched on all this. But that would be kind of one end of a certain view, of a certain Buddha Dharma view, just taking this kind of uh, very realist view, quite a mechanical model. At another end uh, would be just a kind of view, oh, everything's empty, including uh, virtues and mind states and values and all that. It's all empty. Ethics is empty too. So I think one of the things that's really important here is to um, c- question and uh, yes, question uh, immature and too uh, an Im- any kind of immature or too hasty relativism regarding um, ontology and epistemology of ethics any immature or too hasty kind of nihilism regarding ethics. So we've touched on a little bit of this before, um, I think, in the Sina and Soul Talks and also here. Um, you know, uh, several people have pointed out, including, I think, the philosopher W. Stays, just because people have not been able to conclusively prove an independent existence of ethics, it doesn't mean that there isn't an independent existence of values and bond of, of, of morality. So just to conclude that from the fact that so far human beings have been unable to do that, is not act, doesn't actually logically follow. And similarly with a kind of scientistic view, based on uh, uh, what's real is only what's <clears throat> uh, measurable and material. And this kind of reductionist scientific view, and there's no place in that for questions of value or our feelings towards value. They're all just illus- illusory. This is kind of just immature, partial, blinkered thinking. Ethics exists for human beings. And as long as there are human beings in the universe, ethics has a reality because there are human beings. So just because it only exists for human beings doesn't mean that it doesn't have it has less reality. This goes back to Descartes and Galileo and all that. Or, you know, someone like the philosopher Richard Rorty, and we talked about him as well, and dismissing any ontology or epistemology underlying ethics, and then just insisting what we need to do ethically is just keep the conversation going. We need to keep the conversation going. Well, why? 
why do we need to keep the conversation going? That's an ethical assertion, and on what are you basing it? But because he's ruled out from the beginning any possibility of basing ethics in anything else, in any other uh, dimension, or value-giving dimension, he can't answer that. And so a lot of the time he just kind of talks in, in circles. And we can have a kind of similar uh, immaturity bringing, in bringing the teachings of emptiness to bear on uh, the whole domain of ethics. Um, actually, before I get onto that, um, you know, it seems to me, and I, I've probably said this elsewhere, it seems to me that those who emphasize, uh, whether they're in the Dharma or outside of the Dharma, those who emphasize the impossibility of knowing any um, dimension uh, or um, ground for ethics, for virtues, for values, um, are at the same time clinging sometimes explicitly, more usually tacitly, uh, to the classical scientific materialist view of reality. So very postmodern uh, and in 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 one in the domain of ethics and other other domains. But underneath that, or in other areas of life, just just actually really clinging on to the classical scientific materialist reality, very not postmodern. Anything that sort of Descartian, Galilean science posits or explains as real is real in this view. And anything else, for example, ethics or values, etc., is not. But we talked about Descartes, and actually that came just from a decision in the first place. And, uh, and Galileo also made a decision, and it became a truth. But then eventually even the whole scientific method, which they helped help to start, so sort of ended up uh, pulling the rug out of their, their starting uh, modus operandi and their starting definitions. And we also pointed out how that... Um, how those definitions about what was real and how that scientific methodology over time it started with people who were religious. Yes, Galileo was subject to the Inquisition or oppressed by the Inquisition, but they were still religious. Descartes was a very religious um, person. And in fact, a lot of his so-called logic relies on the existence of God as part of the, the taken-for-granted existence of God proves other parts of his logical ed- edifice. So he had all kinds of doubt, that's his sort of Descartian scepticism, but actually it, it, one thing he didn't doubt was the existence of God. Galileo and <clears throat> others, Locke, these were all genuinely religious thinkers, and what they started was rooted in and motivated uh, even by uh, religious thinking and religious aspiration to a certain extent. But then over history, as we've traced a little bit in this talk, over history, um, following that thread about, okay, this is real and that's not, etc. And then all kinds of um, implications and consequences, including implications and consequences for ethics, unfolded or, or, uh, through, through history over several hundred years. One, one step was taken and it, it, it in turn, in time, implied another step, or together with certain social developments, it implied another step, etc. But anyway, if we come back to uh, emptiness, so really important. 
um, to, to realize knowing the emptiness of all things, understanding in one's heart the emptiness of all things, does not, will not lead to a nihilistic morality. It absolutely won't. It's not the way I understand it. I've said I've said this before. The emptiness means things are not real. It also means things are not not real. Neither real nor not real. And to me, the indicator of insight into emptiness is care. Is even an increase in care. Care for others, care for the world. An indicator of insight is that the presence and even the f- f- uh, increased felt sense of importance of values and virtues. An increased orientation to them. Not a decrease. Not a letting go and a negligence. An increase in compassion. These are the indicators to me of insight into emptiness. If that's not there and someone's talking about emptiness, either I'm not interested, but if I'm in a teaching position, I'm very interested because something's really not right. Something's off. It's not, it's not the middle way of emptiness. And I would also say, and it's certainly in the way at least I, I would teach emptiness and, and the practices that lead to it, there's so much sensitivity required and cultivated in, in that path of practice that I think sensitivity too, including uh, heart sensitivity and ethical sensitivity, all that will uh, grow in the course of deepening one's insight into emptiness. So we've talked about a lot of this before, and sometimes people say, when they hear about the emptiness thing, oh, oh, but then I won't, I won't, you know, I'll, everything's empty, so I won't care about ethics, etc. Just very briefly recapping what must have been, in, I'm assuming, the first talk of this series. Um, the talk on emptiness and ways of looking. And the way I would teach emptiness with, you know, via ways of looking and fabrication, we're not starting uh, with asking anyone to believe the emptiness of all things. That, that would be uh, really unwise. And usually then almost everyone would just say, but then I wouldn't care, or then nothing would matter. They don't really understand, they're not ready to jump to that level. We start with these two, two um, threads, the possibility of, of ways of looking, possibility of developing flexibility of ways of looking, and the notion of the fabrication of suffering, of self, of eventually of, of world, of objects, etc. We start even just with the, the notion of fabrication of suffering and then have a look how the self is, etc. And just start with those two possibilities which almost no one can deny, and you explore, and it's an open-ended, experiential, first-hand experiential inquiry, rather than starting by believing something and then and then kind of acting ethically on this belief that I don't really understand. One doesn't open-ended mean one doesn't decide the limit of fabrication, or one doesn't pre-decide that everything is empty, everything is an illusion. One doesn't know what that means yet. Secondly, we said um, emptiness ways of looking, once you've developed lots of them, are just then uh, different lenses, different ways of looking that we can pick up and put down at any time based on uh, or responsive to um, the needs of the situation. What helps to reduce suffering here? If that's my intention. For self, for other, for world, etc. And we also said... um, it, it might be in other ways of approaching emptiness through analyses or through uh, you know intellectual analysis practice as they do in the Gelug tradition in Tibet or through the idea of some way of practice where emptiness gets construed as a sort of big empty space with insubstantial objects and not much self or the sort of um, one kind of interpretation of a Theravadan view of emptiness as the machine-like process of ag- aggregates. None of those, uh, none of those three, will automatically um, it, uh, weave in, integrate, have integrated in them uh, the uh, understanding and the exploration of dependent arising, which is the exploration of karma. 
and how this intention, that way of looking, this way of acting, actually um, brings about this sense of self, this sense of world, this much suffering, uh, this kind of suffering. We're seeing dependent origination and karma work right then when we're approaching it through the ways of looking, um, fabrication uh, way. So ethics is integrated unavoidably right from the beginning. Karma is integrated unavoidably right from the beginning into into the emptiness exploration, into the emptiness teachings. And, and it's something we see and know and feel firsthand. And that runs all the way through, as opposed to teaching emptiness in some way, and then somehow you have to kind of, now we have to stick, stick back ethics in it because we're uh, concerned that um, might what we've done with emptiness might imply that ethics is irrelevant or we might have forgotten about it. Anyway, that's all repeat. But we need to be careful, uh, you know, again, with the whole emptiness thing, also not to be lazy and sloppy. And there's many ways we can be. And certainly around um, the relationship of emptiness and ethics. So ethics are empty. Therefore, what? Um, just because there's no universal agreement doesn't necessarily imply that ethics are empty. What do I even mean when I say ethics are empty? This we've already said. But even take, take something like um, killing is wrong. So... Em- Ethics is empty, therefore it's not true to say killing is wrong, or it doesn't apply. But it's it's just going into just even a little bit more uh, carefully. We'll see that actually, in relation to the notion of killing being wrong, there's always, in all cultures and societies, what's interesting, or if you like, where the emptiness uh, resides, is in the question, when is it deemed okay? to kill. So it's not a blanket sort of sloppy just killing is wrong or no because ethics is empty and everything's empty, killing is okay. It's neither wrong nor right. It's in the detail. When is it deemed okay? put to sleep, a, a, a pet that we love, there's the question of euthanasia, there's the question of, um, what's it called, assisted, you know, dignified dying, assisted suicide, when someone's um, terminally ill, is it okay to kill when you prevent a murder, or you prevent a mass murder, or you prevent uh, someone like Hitler, or, you know, all these questions, is there such a thing as a justifiable war? You know, this is where it gets interesting. And then just to say ethics is empty, uh, it's still, we can still say ethics is empty because those details are hard to work out. And maybe not, maybe we cannot arrive um, at a uh, a very clear, final, definite conclusion to some of these questions. That's where the emptiness resides. Or, Similarly, you know, um, again, if you think oh, everything's empty, okay, well, is 2 plus 2 is 4? 2 plus 2 equals 4. Is that empty of the truth? Is that empty of being true? So what's the whole relationship between truth and emptiness? You could say 2 plus 2 equals 4 is dependent on counting to understand it. And you could even say it, 2 plus 2 is 4 um, in order to be a truth is dependent on the specification of the, the base, the numerical base. For example, in what well, says base 10, isn't it? We call that. But in base 3, 2 plus 2 equals, what would it equal? It would equal 11. 2 plus 2 equals 1, 1. 
you could say 2 plus 2 is 4 is dependent on perception of 2 and perception of 1, etc. You could say all that. But any of those qualifications and dependencies don't deprive the, uh, the equation 2 plus 2 equals 4 of a certain inviolable and, inviolable and, and non-empty truth. And, and it may be similar with ethics. There may be lots that is dependent on individual uh, or cultural perspectives. And as we said, on just the fact of human being. There are truths for human beings. But it still might be the case that Hartman's firmament of values um, may have an absolute, um, relatively independent existence, reality, truth to it. So, um, two things here. One is that uh, when we when we use the teachings of emptiness, it's really important, whether it's in regard to ethics, and certainly in regard to ethics, but also in regard to soul-making and imaginal practice. To me, it's important not to be sloppy and lazy. So that's one thing. And the second thing is... Um, with regard to ethics, you know, the ontological and epistemological questions and issues and needs um, surpass what can be provided by just the notion that things are empty. So we said, yeah, for liberation, emptiness is enough. For lots of other things, it's not enough as an ontology. We said that in one of the early talks of this series. And it also said... Um, ontology, epistemology, ethics, emotions, these areas of our existence. And they are areas of our existence. They're not just philosophical areas. As I said, ontology, epistemology, ethics, emotions, there's probably others. They are endless. I, th- I don't think humanity will ever come to an end of their exploration. And uh, what did I say? You know, it's like, uh, you know, if someone says, oh, I figured them all out, I figured, or any one of those, I figured ontology, I figured it all out, or epistemology, or whatever it is, run away from that person as a teacher. And if someone says, uh, you know, don't, don't bother, it's not interesting, it's not useful, it's a waste of time, there's no point. Just ignore ontology and epistemology. I would run away from them as well, as a teacher. So, um, as we said, you know, really right from the beginning, I think, in the soul-making Dharma teachings, ontology and epistemology, or considering ontologies and epistemology and questions and issues there, really support soul-making. It really um, gives ground to, opens up space for, and also furthers soul-making practice and soul-making possibilities. Soul-making needs ontology and epistemology, and I would say ethics too. Actually, by this point you might have got a sense that ethics is just a part of soul-making. Soul-making is an approach to ethics, but ethics is definitely a part of soul-making. Soul making, therefore ethics, needs ontology and epistemology, it needs us to turn that soil, to mull over, to be creative, to discover, to question, to open up, to play and construct. And ontology and epistemology, like ethics and uh, in the area of emotionality, all these areas, all these domains can themselves become erotic, imaginal objects for us. Our relationship to them in themselves can become soul-making and soulful. So I think these areas uh, are, are endless. And I hope, you know, my hope is that others someone or some others in the future will, sometime in the future, will add to um, what we've been developing here and develop it further and build on it. I think we need to um, 
certainly in soul making dharma, again, as ethics is a part of that, we need to, and I would say any ethics probably needs to include ontology. There needs to be the inclusion of ontology. So I would say soul making dharma needs the inclusion of ontology, but let's say inconclusively. In other words, in this open ended way. And it might be the same with regard to any anyone trying to move forward with ethics these days. The ontology needs to be included, but in a kind of inconclusive way, maybe. But in a way, that's kind of that kind of attitude to ontology and epistemology is uh, kind of axiomatic to um, fundamental to soul making dharma. You know, we can look back in history and the sort of, let's say, the kind of literalism, ontological um, literalism of the belief in God in the ancient Judaic tradition, for example, of the Old Testament, or that kind of ontology, or Plato's ontology, or Descartes, or Galileo's ontology, or Bacon's, uh, which is very similar, of course, or a kind of monistic materialism, this uh, there is nothing but matter, mind is, mind is really just material. Um, that kind of ontology, or the you know, notions of truth uh, that Karl Popper put forward, etc. All of these, over history, seem to have uh, flourished and then kind of run into problems, gone out of fashion, um, failed, fallen short in some way. And again, we can have that sort of what, what in some postmodern circles becomes a kind of uh, um, a widespread view, which is, oh, just forget the whole thing about ontology. Or we can say, still we can move forward here. Still we can play. Still we can create and discover. Still we can ask questions. So, um, so as I said, regarding or relative to ethics, it's, it's important that it's the the ontology and epistemology is, is related to is very related to the dimensionality. So it's the ontology and epistemology of dimensionality in part that's really crucial in the ethical question, in the question of ethics, and it becomes important to. Establish, is that really the right word? To construct, create, discover, provide, explore, as I said, elbow space for, against uh, the sort of inevitable, against the usually default sort of indoctrination of ideas around ontology, epistemology, with regard to the dimensionality or whatever we're, we're trying to. Uh, whatever ways we're trying to give dimension to values, to virtues, to ethics. So, we talked, we spent a long time in the Seal and Soul uh, series talking, uh, sorry, in the Seal and Soul talk of the um, Four Parables of Stone and Light series. The um, We spent a long time talking about the notion of ideal reality, or the realm of ideas, started with Plato. And Hartman, uh, we, we spoke a lot about his moral philosophy, and Hartman as uh, picking up that the notion of ideal reality, or the realm of ideas and, val- and values being a part of that, the realm of values being a, a part of the ideal realm, or the realm of ideas and the ontology there, and uh, pointing out that, as we said, they exist for human beings, but that doesn't mean that they're not real. Hartman would say, just as geometrical laws exist just for spatial figures, and physiological laws exist for organic, uh, organic beings, well, moral laws exist for uh, human beings. So it doesn't take anything away from their reality. This geometrical law, it just is true. It exists. 
but it only exists for spatial beings. Geometrical law has nothing to say whatsoever about anger, for example. No geometrical law has anything to, to, to say about anger. So, and I can't remember if I said this in the Sealer and Soul talk, but for Plato and Hartman, um, the, the, the realm of ideas, which includes values, exists. It has ontological validity. It exists as a kind of reality. For Plato, um, they, the, the realm of ideas, the realm of forms, was more real than any instantiation of that form. So, beauty... As a, as a kind of ideal reality, was more real than any material instantiation of something that was beautiful. And that's a very rare perspective and opinion and ontology these days. Someone like J.N. Findlay, who I've talked about in previous talks, he upheld that uh, kind of inversion of the usual ontological hierarchy that instantiations of things were less real than um, <clears throat> than the idea of the ideal realm. And I paralleled that in the realm of mathematics and talking about the number pi and other things. Um, and we also, earlier in this talk, we talked about the, um, the possible etymology or phonetic uh, relationship between the words beauty, virtue and virtual, uh, meaning something that's an image of something more real. And the thing itself is more real. The image is uh, less real. So our virtues in the world are just an image, a copy, a not real copy of something that's more real. A real, a really existing uh, virtue or value. And virtually, the word virtually possibly being uh, interpreted, connected, uh, interpreted as connected by some things, it's not quite the real thing. It's virtually the real thing. To remember what we talked about virtual reality, that would be the image, and virtually almost not quite the real thing. So Plato had this, what sounds to most people today, a very unusual ontology about this level of the realm of ideas being more real than the level of material reality and things and tables and horses or whatever it is. Um, for Hartman, uh, the level of ideal reality was less real. It's still real and had a kind of reality, but actually less real. Um, ideal being, he said, was a kind of thinner, floating insubstantial being, half being, so to speak, he wrote, uh, which still lacks the full weight of being. Being being what is material, uh, primarily. Um, so in his view, there was a kind of hierarchy from uh, of what was most real, from inorganic being, to and dependent on inorganic being, there was organic being, so dependent on chemicals, there is life, uh, living some kind of living organism. Dependent on uh, some on there being a li living organism, there is mental being, and that's so that's dependent on organic being. And dependent on mental being, there is a spiritual being. And what he meant by spiritual being was the whole realm of language, uh, ethics, morality, arts, religion, law, politics philosophy, ideology, historical consciousness, etc. That's uh, a lot of... That's what those guys primarily meant by spiritual being. Those guys meaning... Well, Hartman, let's just say. However, that view that Hartman had uh, has been brought into question. That hierarchy, which most people would agree with, my, m m m minus even his... Most people agree the most real thing is matter. And then kind of stacked on that hierarchy, you get things that are kind, kind of real, and then you get into this area where, well, they're sort of real, but um, not really real. And you get to the values, and some people would really uh, 
a lot of people would disagree to those have reality in themselves do those have an independent existence um, so Owen Barfield for example as an example of a philosopher who would who questioned that whole uh, typical hierarchy of reality ontological hierarchy that Hartman put forward and for instance in his Saving the Appearances. It's a well-known book that he wrote. Just uh, really uh, pulling that apart, really. And again, um, uh, developments in physics, particularly in quantum mechanics, really questioning that order. And it's worth it's worth pointing out, too, that Hartman uh, really... Um, really was quite strong in his criticism of Plato's hierarchical ontology there. Because for Hartman, he thought that Plato's idea that if, if the ideal realm is more real, if the forms, these divine forms, are more real than the things of this world, the, the things of this world, he thought that kind of philosophy will only lead, or can only lead, to a devaluation and a disregard of this real world, of what is what Hartman thought is this is real. If you believe some other realm is higher and and more real, and this is kind of illusion, it can only lead to a disregard of this world. And it's possible, uh, it's possible it can, um, and that it ha- has even that kind of philosophy has fueled that kind of attitude at times in history. But when this world is the only thing that's real, and it's viewed in those material ways, and it's the only thing that's real, then we've seen how what a poor ethics that can eventually deliver, or leave us with. And actually, the the notion that there's an ideal realm, that they are, they are as saying, these are the attributes of God, these are... Uh, the divine intelligences, the divine angels, and that in a way they have more reality than this world. This world is just an image, or uh, it's just images and refractions of them. Or even that uh, this this world is is completely real too, but is somehow uh, has its origins in in that ideal realm. It's it's not necessary, it doesn't necessarily follow that there's a devaluation of this material world and the things of this world at all. Actually, quite the opposite. It can be that because things uh, reflect and have their roots in the divine and the divine attributes in this realm of ideas, that there's a greater sanctity to the things of this world. And even for someone who's a kind of um, very secular-minded, like you imagine a, a physicist and thinking this way about um, how everything has its roots in the mathematical laws of the equations that rule the universe, that govern the universe. And there is very often a kind of sanctity that that then... Um, so that level has in itself that the ideal realm of mathematics, but um, also in 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 a sanctity that it then bestows, a kind of level of sanctity that it bestows on the material things of this world, the everyday things that we encounter. So, I disagree with Hartman that it necessarily it necessarily demeans the things of this world, and there will be a disregard and a devaluing of them. It's so often portrayed that way. And just taken as a sort of, well, obviously, Plato's ideas would do that and lead to that. I really think this is one of the things we should question in terms of uh, the implications of any particular ontology. Uh, So, difference between Plato and Hegel there, and... um, just staying with that physics thing for a while, you know, like like I said, so if a quark, a f- supposedly fundamental particle, 
is only a thing for observers. It only becomes a thing in any sense that we would use that word thing, like as being somewhere at some time and having certain properties, like certain mass or a certain uh, direction and um, velocity and occur, you know, all that. If a quark is only a thing for observers, and kind of in itself, really, there is only this ultra-complex, multi-dimensional mathematical idea, really, then two things. One is, again, that, that would be a, 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 an instance of a sort of ideal reality having um, an ideal level, a level of idea, the mathematical idea, kind of having more reality than the actual instance of the quark, which only comes into uh, apparent reality when, when when there's an observer there. And indeed, there are some physicists today who say that, in a way, only the ma- those mathematical laws that govern the universe, they're, they're the only things that are real. Matter is not real in the way we understand it. What's real are the mathematical laws. Space and time and all that. What's real are the mathematical laws. So there's that view. That's one thing. The second thing is uh, if this quark is only a thing for observers and in itself it really all there is is this complex, ultra-complex, multi-dimensional mathematical idea, then the assumed ontological comparison with the reality of hard matter is softened. I mean, at the very least, it's softened. Uh, Yes, similar thing when we... um, Yes, similar thing when we have, you know, talked about emptiness as an... uh, providing a kind of minimum for a minimum ontology for uh, justifying soul making dharma or justifying imaginal practice as we said you know oftentimes Im- images will get dismissed uh, ontologically very quickly so because something in the back of the mind is saying oh yeah but but it's not real and it's an image is held in comparison with something that is assumed, like whatever at this table, assumed to be really real. So at a minimum, we say, well, the emptiness of all things takes away any really real. Yes, as we said before, there's an ontological difference, in, there's a different ontic status between this table and an imaginal table. But, uh, but as a minimum, what one's doing is um, uh, taking away or, or reducing, uh, dissolving a kind of backdrop, backdrop object, ob- object and objection to taking images seriously. And then I don't know, I don't know enough about Hegel's philosophy, but it might be that different inter- or some interpretations of Hegel actually allow uh, the level of idea uh, to have a kind of more fundamental reality, but it involves the material and it plays out in the, in the movements of the material and the movements of politics and the movements of all of that. Uh, so perhaps different interpretations of Hegel also uh, may be uh, may provide different um, 
configurations or reworkings of this whole um, ontological hierarchy question between ideal being and uh, so-called you know in, instantations of ideal being or reality as we usually think of it or material being etc but that might be for someone else to pursue I don't know enough about Hegel's philosophy and I, I know that there's very different interpretations but the little that I know it could could be quite interesting that actually the ideal being has more fundamental existence so again if we translate that to ethics the, the, the value has more uh, fundamental existence than the instantiation And the, in Hegel's idea, the development of this value, the movement of this value, the history of this value is the primary thing. And it subsumes, if you like, the uh, material and the historical in that. But really what's happening is, is there's uh, a, a, an evolution of, of a value at the, idea, at the level of idea. That could be one version of an interpretation of Hegel in relation to all this. So, again, we always have questions of epistemology uh, regarding anything, regarding material things, regarding... Uh, ethical things, meditative things, as always, we can't get away from questions of epistemology. It's important to acknowledge, I think, even, um, so it's, it's more to acknowledge w with regard to, you know, virtues and values and ethics, even if um, a person says, I ostensibly understand, it's, it, it, you know, or even seems to ostensibly understand, um, it's difficult, it's impossible to prove the reality of values person has that view, but they're still acting and choosing according to their values. And what I would like to add to that is, uh, you know, Nietzsche said, well, um, yeah, most of that's just, they're acting from indoctrination, from stupidity, from habit, etc. Their values are uh, basically indoctrination, stupidity, and habit. A pretty critical view. But what I want to say is, we still act and choose according to our values. All human beings do. And it's not all because of fear and conformity. Something's happening in our choices, in our ethical choices regarding values. We're trusting something. What are we trusting as uh, an epistemic authority? What are we trusting? It's, I, I, I know this. I, I feel this way or I think or whatever it is. What are we trusting? And usually it's some sense. It's some felt sense, a moral sense, a conscience, um, a sense of nobility or, or beauty, some push or pull in the being, some sense of that. Could it be that anyway we're trusting something and what we're trusting is some sense. And could it be that that some sense that we're trusting is maybe the, the very beginnings of a kind of uh, sensing with soul sensibility regarding values and virtues and the choices we make? So I don't know. Is anyone entirely logical and rational in, in the substance and the basis of their ethical choices? Is there anyone who just kind of computes like a machine? I mean, people more or less. But I think there's always some sense, some moral sense. And and some, I wonder if, if part of that moral sense has to do with a sense of what's noble, what's beautiful, something, something pulling me, calling me, something um, uh, to which I, I push away from. And could that be that the sort of... Uh, very in a very inchoate form, 
the, 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 just the beginning, the germ, uh, just a, a, a fraction, a portion of, of soul-making uh, soul sensibility with regard to values and virtues. We are trusting some sense, and, and I would say we do have some hierarchical differentiation between different values. Contrary to what the utilitarians would um, say or allow us or give any weight to. And also the those who just interpret the Buddha Dharma perspective as just saying, well, just reduce suffering, just reduce suffering. This just reduce suffering, this goal to reduce suffering or end suffering is usually for something else, even if I haven't articulated what that something else is. Even if I don't uh, realize that it's for something else. So when I gave the sort of thought experiment of that for falling and then realizing there's no ground, how that would be, just to imagine that everyone's okay with that. And you've worked towards everyone being okay with that. Just falling. The reduction of suffering is for something else in the end. Or, let's say, past a certain point of, of, of reduction of suffering. Something... Uh, that is that we feel is good in some kind of ultimate way, worthwhile, beautiful, meaningful. Some people are scared of this idea. Sometimes I've mentioned it to people who are you know very committed Buddhists, or they've heard me say it in a talk or something. Maybe ending suffering isn't isn't the um, or reducing suffering isn't the main thing or isn't the final goal or whatever. And seems like it really stirs, uh, it really bothers some people. But again, the, my, my invitation is to just have a look, have a look, sense in, feel in. If that thought experiment works for you or something similar, even if you're scared of the idea, see, is there not something else behind, underneath your concern and your efforts to reduce suffering and your focus on reducing suffering? Isn't there something else, another level? <clears throat> so, it could be that already what's operating for us, even if a person has never heard of soul making, or has heard of it and doesn't like it, or doesn't practice it, or whatever, it could already be that a part of <clears throat> how we are navigating our ethical choices is actually in in through the means of some very kind of inchoate and dimly sent sent version of um, sensing with soul of soul making practice with regard to ethics. It could already be that that's what people are doing. We are doing. So, is it possible to develop that? <clears throat> Ontologically there, though, epistemologically there, there's this, we're already trusting something. What are we trusting? How is it working in us? And is it, is it uh, possibly the case that what we're actually already trusting is the beginnings of soul-making uh, soul approach, but we don't know that language, or we don't know that practice, or we, another part of our mind objects to it, but actually that's already part of what's going on. It's part of what's... Uh, what, how we're func how we're uh, functioning epistemologically with regard to ethics and ethical choices and values. So maybe that's already the case, I and mean, then maybe it's uh, something that can be developed. And we've already said, you know, we've already considered um, a couple of times already um, the possibility that or, of regarding eros as epistemologically valid and as uh, ontologically guiding and validating as John Milbank wrote um, giving it an ontologically disclosive status 
the eros if we have a, 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 a view of truth not as a definite this or that and a final arriving point but more as this journey of provisional truths as it in fact is is the actuality in science as a journey of provisional truths progressive stages of provisional truth and if we have that idea and how congruent that is with the way eros works eros as what takes us what galvanizes the soul making dynamic which also means the, the perception of course psyche the sense of what we are um, in relationship with and the idea of it the logos and taking us more into depth that's the eros is what opens up the depth what opens up opens us up to the depth and the successive openings, the successive disclosures of truth or reality, but truth and reality just conceived a little bit more maturely, really, or differently. So, eros as epistemologically valid and also as ontologically guiding and validating in terms of depth, but also in terms of direction, so that there's, uh, I would say, there can be and there will be with soul making practice, a trust of the kind of the compass needle, the orientation of eros. Not just that it will take me deeper, but also where it points, the direction. And all this is within the careful discipline of soul making dharma practice and sensibility. It's not just, oh, so truth can be whatever I like or whatever you like. No, we're talking about a real discipline here, and anyone who knows soul-making down the practice and really practices understands that, should understand that. It's a difficult training. It's asking a lot. It's even asking a lot of people who've done a lot of meditative training before. But, yeah, I'm just wondering if actually what's going on for people anyway is the beginnings or the little... Uh, you know, very partial fragment of a uh, small version of soul-making sensibility, sensing with soul sensibility anyway in regard to ethics. Okay, can we, can we fill that out? Can we give it more ontological and epistemological support in our thinking? Elbow more room and provide possible possible ways of conceiving the ontology and the epistemology with support taking that further seeing what it does and we already looked um, at how soul making dharma uh, can give uh, alternatives or modifications or sophistications of the ontology and epistemology um, with respect to the dimensions or the ways of providing dimensions through the notion of cosmic order or voluntarism. We looked at all that already. How what soul making Dharma can come in and just rethink those whole possibilities and put them on different ontological and epistemological uh, footing. So it's interesting, um, for Hartman, I was. Uh, you know, taken with this idea of a value firmament uh, and its hierarchy, but as far as I could find in what he wrote, he just seems to state there just is an, an independent existence to the value firmament and its hierarchy, the firmament of values. It's just that we can't grasp it all at once, and some people are not very talented at um, recognizing and differentiating values. And I'd like to compare, let's compare that kind of statement with, uh, go back to St. Augustine and something else he wrote um, in, his, uh, in his text on the Trinity. He's talking here about his uh, theory of illumination, the notion of illumination, where he really means that our minds and our hearts are basically open to the light of God, open to be illuminated by the light of God. They function through the light of God, the light of God, the light of the divine permeates our hearts and minds. So even that's a, it's a beautiful idea, it's a beautiful image. 
and he writes, God is holy everywhere, whence it is that the mind lives and moves and has its being in him, and therefore it can remember him. Not that it remembers him because it knew him in Adam, Adam of the Garden of Eden, or at any other time and place before entering the life of its body, or at the time it was created and inserted into its body. It remembers none of these things, whichever of them really happened to it. They are all consigned to oblivion. It remembers him by turning towards the Lord. As to the light which in some fashion had reached it, even while it had been turned away from him. This is the reason why the wicked, too, can think of eternity and make correct judgments of approval and disapproval about human conduct. What are the rules according to which they judge, but the rules which show everyone how to live, even though they may not themselves live according to them? How do they know them? How, how does a wicked person realize what's right and wrong? Certainly not in their own natures, for although undoubtedly it's by the mind that these things are seen, it is clear that their minds are changeable. Whereas whoever perceives in his mind these rules as the standard of conduct also perceives them to be unchangeable. Again, there's this um, notion of eternal, independent, objective existence of these values and ethical rules. Again, it is not any disposition of their minds, of the minds of the wicked, that they're able to do this, since the rules are rules of righteousness, whereas their minds are X hypothesis is the whole basis of what we're saying, is their minds are unjust. So it's not through righteousness. Where then are these rules written? Where is it the unjust can discover what is just? Where do they see what they ought to have and lack? Where are the rules written but in the book of that light which we call truth? Here it is that all the rules of righteousness are inscribed, are inscribed, and it is from here that they pass into the heart of the just man, not by bodily transfer, but as though learning, as though, as though leaving their imprint on him, just as the design of a seal, like a wax seal, is impressed in the wax without leaving the seal. So again, I don't know how all that language lands with you um, I know some people will really object to it uh, for lots of di different reasons um, I don't have that history so I, I find it very touching even though I may not agree with all of it But and I can really understand how a lot of people are wounded uh, through certain histories and then that language really turns them off but for me um, there's something very beautiful there and this idea of a sort of an absolute light of God, as we were talking about the light of the prism the other day as an analogy, and then the attributes of God, like the refraction, the refracted light, the different wavelengths, the different colors, and the beauties of those different colors. And this idea of that light permeating our soul, permeating our mind, so that it's accessible to us, and these, the values are eternal because they're part of that light and they're accessible because that light permeates our consciousness, permeates our being. But it's interesting, if we pick up, I just want to pick up a line there because uh, to me it's actually ambiguous what he means. Um, this is the reason why the wicked too can think of eternity and make correct judgments of approval and disapproval about human conduct. So, does he mean by think of eternity, mean think of hell, for example, and uh, the punishments that await them, and then, uh, you know, fearfully repent? Or does he mean by think of eternity something much more congruent with um, soul-making dharma, contemplating the timeless, or having a sense of the timeless in some way or other? And that sense of the timeless, timelessness opens up a sense of dimensionality, of divinity, of soul-making, etc., which opens up the sensing the soul, which 
naturally opens up the sense of the ideational, imag- imaginal, and the dimensionality and divinity of values and virtues. So I don't know. Does he mean that? Does he mean actually timelessness? Eternity in that sense? Or does he mean think of eternity and eternal punishment and eternal reward? I have no idea. Actually, I don't know enough of his work to know. But um, but even if he meant eternal punishment and reward in that sense, we could, again, soul-making Dharma could uh, modify what he wrote there and take the beautiful idea, this idea of something that is um, absolute in this sense of beyond all categories, beyond all attributes, like when people talk about the Dharmakaya, or people talk in the Via Negativity about the nature of the ultimate Godhead, beyond anything that can be said about it, all that. Um, and uh, take that beautiful idea, and that light is that light permeating our consciousness, and uh, and it's some one of the elements of the imaginal that then opens up the whole sense, and within that whole sense, there will be a soul-making sense of values, and they will have dimensionality and divinity and beauty and duty and necessity and all of that. So it's possible he meant eternal punishment and reward, but we can modify that. And uh, then this beautiful idea, for me, beautiful idea uh, and, and even beautiful language that he's using can be modified from the perspective and the understanding of soul-making dharma. But what it will lead to is, is a slightly different conclusion, I think, than what Augustine, than what I think Augustine is implying. Because it won't then imply... Um, uh, and necessarily always the same conclusions about, and we said this before, an activity or a thing in itself. But rather, um, this activity or that thing will be sensed with soul, and then um, imply, implicit in that is the sense of divinity and dimensionality and duty and the self's autonomy, the duty and my autonomy, beauty, creation, discovery, fullness of intention, all that will be there. So not the thing in itself, but a different sense of this thing compared to that thing, this choice compared to that choice. And um, can we trust that? The fullness of intention and, and all the other soul-making dharma elements. So there's a soul-making dharma modification, perhaps, of what he said. Probably, I would guess, but I don't know. In terms of what he said about eternity, the eternal, contemplating eternal. But there's also probably a modification, as we've said before, in terms of what it, uh, what it, where it delivers us to in relation to. uh, It won't be a universal this thing or that thing, this activity or that activity is taboo, proscribed, or prescribed. But that what, we, what we're delivered to is a soul, uh, a soul-making sense of something, and of something over something else. And that can, can guide us. Can we trust that to guide us? And also, I don't know if I mentioned this the other day, I think I mentioned it very briefly, you know, is there any place of for antinomies in Augustine's view of ethics? Uh, we talked a lot about them in Sila and Soul. But it may well be the case that uh, through a soul-making dharma practice, and soul-making practice in relation to ethical choices, that antinomies are there, are felt, but they're resolved, they're solved for us through through the bringing the soul-making practice to bear. Because, okay, I appreciate that these are antinomies, there's two moral pulls in different directions, but I uh, feel, for me, guided to choose this one. And that's, I can trust that it's ethical, but I also know, I'm mature enough to know that, yes, and that means I'm neglecting this other one. This, there's an antinomy there, as Hartman says, and I emphasize so much in the scene of Soul Talks, we cannot get away from antinomies. So I don't know if Augustine doesn't see that or tries to avoid the whole issue, 
But soul making Dharma practice as well helps us navigate those, those antinomies and accept the inevitable guilt, if we're going to call it guilt. The fact that in navigating an antinomy, in making a choice in life, and I have to make a choice, I have to make choices in life. Sitting on a fence forever is not, as Hartman calls that, that's really a sin. But I accept the inevitable guilt. One example I've given um, several times, I think, is, you know, I wrote this letter to to, uh, Dharma teachers ten years ago, I think it was, and um, about climate change and about flying so much in the Dharma. And and I was fully aware there was a very strident tone, a very critical, very um, aggressive, perhaps even sounded arrogant. I was very aware of that. And I was aware that it was going to um, piss people off and hurt people, and or people would feel hurt, rather. Um, but I sent it anyway, and uh, yes, and quite a lot of people apparently were not, not happy at all. But I still, to this day, do not regret sending it. It was a soul choice. And I was tuning in to the, there was an antinomy there to write it that way, to write it another way, to, to write, to send it, to not send it. So it was soul that was guiding me, really. Even though at that time my understanding of all that was much much, uh, much less clear to me, much less articulated, much less explored. But it was really soul that was guiding me. And I, and I fully uh, accept that I was, in a way, neglecting let's say, other moral values and virtues through the tone of the letter and, 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 and all that. But that somehow it seemed necessary to, to write it in that, in that way, in that tone. So I accept, I accept the, the guilt of, of neglecting those other values in the way that I wrote it. But if all this sounds... You know, because it may be for some people, again, who are not that experienced in actual soul-making Dharma practice. Now, I know there are some people who have listened to loads of, loads of talks, and maybe all the talks on soul-making Dharma, but actually haven't practiced much at all, or not in any way that it's really taken off and really made a big impact on their being in the practice. Maybe touched by the talks, or for whatever reason they're, they're listening, maybe heard other people talk about it. But if you're in that camp, um, you know, and this makes you, I think, I think if you've done a lot of practice, this idea of approaching, of soul-making practice, this idea of approaching ethics with soul-making uh, sensibility and conceptual framework and practices, it, it won't uh, alarm you. And there may be some people that just say, oh, I'm really not sure, I'm really not sure. How do I know I can trust that? The practice hasn't matured enough to uh, give you that trust in the whole paradigm yet. And maybe then an experiment. If, you, if you're really interested in the question, can I trust this? Is this a way forward? If you're really interested in the question, just take the trouble to do a little experiment. Which might be, here's uh, an ethical choice, and practice... Sensing with soul, with in with regard to that ethical choice, as I said, uh, whenever I introduce it, either we said very briefly, either through an image, an imaginal figure that comes up, or through the values and virtues involved as ideal images. Practice sensing the soul that way in regard to that ethical choice, without carrying out the action that that practice uh, implies or suggests without carrying out that choice, unless unless the same conclusion as what the soul-making practice suggests uh, is, is uh, provided via your, whatever your usual mode of approaching and judging ethical choices is. You understand? So you're not actually doing anything different. You're not doing or choosing anything different than you would usually do or choose. But you're adding this practice. And do that many times, with many different situations and many different kind of choices. 
and see what happens. And if you, re- if you don't really care, you're not going to bother to do that. But if you do care, if you're actually really interested in this, in this question, can I really trust this with regard to ethics? Shouldn't we have another basis in ethics? Surely we can't put soul-making as a basis for ethics. There must be ethics as a basis, then soul-making. Surely. Especially when you, I hear you talking about all those weird images you have, Rob, of devouring and devouring beloveds and blood everywhere and ritual slaughter and all that. Surely we must put ethics first and then the soul-making. So if you're really interested in that question, actually do some experimentation on your own, as I've suggested. And do that many times in many different ethical situations and see. And see if uh, what happens is you don't learn to trust that actually the soul-making could be a basis for the ethics. See, you'll know for yourself, and you won't have done anything differently in the course of the experiment. You're not being asked to do anything different uh, than, than you would have done anyway, or chosen anyway. Anyway, so one of the uh, one of the modifications, a kind of very central modification that that the soul making dharma paradigm brings, as we said in regard to uh, the Augustine example and others, and also Augustine's example of the cosmic order, was that excuse me, it's no longer the thing or the action in itself universally that is decreed right or wrong. Valuable, not valuable, ethical or not. It's, it's, um, it's the question of whether it's ensouled and ensoulable. So this is really important. And, uh, you know, yesterday... Just add, uh, we talked about um, the whole notion or the whole uh, fact of this kind of post-Protestant Reformation, this affirmation or elevation of ordinary life, work and production and family and children. Um, and hi- historically that uh, equalization, let's say, of ordinary life, where it was prior to that perhaps seen as uh, less valuable than a life uh, obviously devoted to, uh, consecrated to to God. And then there was historically post-Reformation, with the Reformation, this equalization of ordinary life, this affirmation, elevation of it. And originally, historically, originally, um, one we were seen as taking part in, in God's plan. So, uh, it, it mattered how we approached that. And we saw uh, our ordinary life and, and our work and our family as, as really taking part in God's plan. And that plan uh, eventually was connected with this more horizontal cosmic order. But anyway, we were taking part in God's plan. And then, uh, over time, it, it became just ordinary life without any reference to God. Ordinary life was seen as valuable, as worthwhile, as in itself uh, not just okay, but important, as qualifying as the good life or uh, etc et but the reference to gone to god ha- had gone it was a historical sort of evolution devolution development now uh, with soul making dharma approach what we're saying is it's not um, it's not that it is or isn't that ordinary life is worthwhile or good uh, with a capital g or beautiful in itself but it's how we sense it and how we sense the things of ordinary life, family, work, children. Are we sensing them with soul? Because when we are, then they're rooted in a sense, in our sense, our palpable sense of divinity, Buddha nature, whatever you want to call it. But the ontology there is 
not simply objective and not simply subjective. So it's not in the thing itself as a universal. The value resides universally in this thing for everyone. And that's just true. It's it's in the sense of the soul, well, of the sensing the soul. It's in the soul making sense. And that gives us the sense of divinity. But that sense of divinity is also neither simply objective nor simply subjective. Different ontology. So, in a way, we're not really making a statement about ordinary life or family life and its value. What matters is the relationship. What matters is, is it sensed with soul? And that's, in a way, what it means, uh, what makes it worthwhile, what makes it qualify as living, uh, living a really worthwhile life. The soul is more than heart. So what makes it you know, beautiful in that way. So we're not saying for or against ordinary life or family life or anything like that. That's important. What's important is, is it sensed with soul? And that's... the guide for how to live, what to live, what's worthwhile, which is this bigger question of ethics. So, we just said, neither simply objective nor simply subjective. That's the ontology that's wrapped up in all this, or that's underpinning all this. could leave things there, but could go a little it's further, just extend into a slightly different connection here. Um, and uh, with the risk and probability of actually leaving things a little inconclusive, but uh, I still think it's worth exploring a little bit, because uh, we can, we've been considering, considering ethical values, but we can also consider aesthetic values, or beauty itself, as a value too. And I want to do so now, I've spoken about it before, and I've written about it um, recently, which will be out, well, not for a while, but sometime. Um, and emphasised... In, in both talking about it and writing about it, how, how important and instructive it is to, to actually inquire into beauty and our notions of beauty and our sense of beauty, uh, how important and instructive that is um, uh, with regard to soul-making dharma and practice, how intimate the connection is there. So beauty is a value too. Um, what's the ontology of beauty? And again, William Stace and others would, would can jump right in and say, well, the fact that we don't, um, you can't prove that this or that thing is beautiful, and the fact that people don't agree doesn't mean, does not imply that there doesn't exist an objective, independent uh, truth to beauty. Some people also uh, nowadays would like to say, um, values, ethical values, are illusions, actually, in different uh, different different ways of saying that, or different explanations for why they think that. And they might say, "There's no such thing as beauty, really. What there is is a sense of pleasure." Um, and again. Hartman and others would say, well, beauty exists for human beings, just like values exist for human beings. And in Charles Taylor's words, you know, just as a best account of material re reality includes things like quarks, or our current best account includes things like quarks, uh, in, 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 
to to talk about and to explain the sort of the, how material how, how material reality is and what it is. Our best account includes things like quarks. Our best account of our humanity and our human concerns must include things like values and beauty. Because without them, without those notions and without those that kind of vocabulary, it's not just hard, but actually impossible to um, to choose and to navigate in life. We touched on this before. I can't. I, I might have an idea of um, it's all just atoms or whatever, or even I'm choosing this because it's pleasant or unpleasant. But it's not. It's not really what's. Uh, it's not really the best account of what's moving me in this or that situation, or how I choose. So there's different ontologies with regard to beauty, whether it has independent existence, or whether it's completely an illusion, or you know whether it's neither wholly created by my way of looking, nor fully objectively independently there. It's not just in the eyes of the beholder, but nor is it completely in the object alone. It's create, discovered. Again, this kind of alternate ontology. Alternative ontology. Remember, quarks are participatory too. So the whole thing gets a little more, hmm, that's interesting. Or one... Uh, not sure what the degree of prevalence, but certainly um, a lot of quantum people who really think hard about quantum physics. Because a lot of quantum, a lot of physicists don't think hard about quantum physics. But for the people that do, um, you know, there's some portion that takes seriously the notion that quarks and everything else um, that is so-called material is participatory. As I said, it doesn't exist independent of the observer and, and how it is and what it is and where it is and all that um, depends on the observer. So it's an alternative ontology but it made this um, neither subjective nor objective fully, simply. But it may not just apply to things like values and beauty, it may also apply to material things, as we've talked about. And whatever the ontological status of beauty and of values, you know, these things are deeply important to the soul. And somehow they're communicated soul to soul. Beauty can be communicated soul to soul and shared between souls. And a sense of value, and the beauty of value as well. How wonderful, how amazing this possibility of communication, how wonderful, how amazing the depth to which we can care about these things, to which we feel they're important. So it might be uh, that there's a kind of ontological middle way with regard to beauty that's actually pretty similar to the imaginal middle way. And that's similar to a possible, one of the possible... Uh, ontologies, same kind of ontological middle way regarding values. That would be different, or, or in some w- ways of construing it, that would be different than Hartman's idea of a firmament, firmament of values objectively existing. But actually it could still be made congruent. It could still be made congruent. Depends on our notion of what the mind is. But it's interesting too, if we just reflect a little bit on our culture, or where our culture is at, regarding ontologies of, say, three different domains. Mathematics, ethics, and aesthetics. So, with regard to mathematics, I think most people in our Western culture would agree uh, that there are independently existing mathematical truths. And also that there is a difference in human beings' kind of innate talent to understand those truths 
and to realise those truths, those mathematical truths, and also uh, that some people are obviously much more trained than others are, and that we trust those people who are trained uh, more than we trust the people who are not trained with regard to what's true in mathematics. But these mathematical truths are just widely regarded as independently true, um, whether you're a mathematician or not. With regard to ethics, it's it's quite a bit more complicated. Um, if we think about this question of ethos, of, of what's, what's a really worthwhile life, what's a really beautiful life, then it seems, as I said, kind of uh, almost... almost uh, fundamentally given in our Western culture to say there's no independent truth about that. No one can tell you what's a worthwhile life, what's a beautiful life. So there's quite a strong view that um, ethos in that sense, uh, that's not really the right word, but ethics in that, in that larger sense about what is a worthwhile life, what is, what is really good, what is a good... Um, it is there's no independent truth to that. When it when we shrink the, eth- the domain of ethics down to the question of right and wrong, then people often, or what's very common, is for people to say there is an independent truth. There isn't. There is a truth here about what's right and wrong. But the very fact that um, there's so much argument about what's right and wrong in so many for so many uh, questions and issues. Um, should make us wonder whether our uh, in, whether our sort of aggressive belief that there is a right or wrong is actually uh, tenable. And with regard to talent, etc., um, I think uh, m- m- most people would probably believe that some excuse me, I don't know, psychopaths. Or other people who are, uh, you know, have a mental illness, are not capable, or, or less capable, a lot less capable, a lot less talented in recognizing right and wrong. Um, and in regard to the area of ethics that has to do with what's worthwhile, what's a worthwhile life, what's a beautiful life, the idea of someone being more talented in that domain or being uh, better trained in that domain, um, it, it won't, it's not universally accepted at all. It's probably universally dismissed. The maths, ethics, aesthetics, and then again it gets also really, hmm, that's interesting. It seems to me, I don't know, I was just trying to think this through, it seems to me, um, with classical art, let's say figurative, classical figurative art, literature, music, classical music, classical literature, classical architecture, um, people are often willing to admit this, there's an independent truth there, but I'm not capable of judging it because I'll leave that to the experts. So we agree that there's a training possible there, there's maybe talent possible in ascertaining these things, um, and there must be an independent truth, interestingly. And the expert knows that independent truth. When it comes to more contemporary kind of art, then then it gets really, really uh, more complicated uh, and more, more, I don't know, messy in a way. Um, and here's an interesting thing. I think if, if one cares really deeply about art, and by art I mean all all the arts, or or any, I'm including rather, I'm including if one, I'm including all the arts. So, but if one cares deeply about art, then one's relationship to art is actually related to what one wants art to do and to affect. Yeah. So, what do I... If I really care about art, I'm looking to art for something. I want it to have certain effects. I want it to do something in my soul, or maybe even in the world if I really care about it. And that, that 
uh, a question of what I want it to do, what I want the art to do in my being or in hopefully in other beings. That question is related to ethics in the sense of what I consider good, what I consider is a life worth living, is connected to my sense of dimensionality and maybe even divinity. So if I care deeply about art, I care deeply about what I want art to do. I have a certain certain things that I want art to do to affect. And that's related to my ethics in the larger sense of my sense of what's good, what makes a life worth living, my sense of dimensionality and all that in existence, maybe my sense of divinity, even if I don't use that word, sacredness. And maybe then, if all that's there, I tend to harbour a view that tends towards uh, a sense of the independent existence of truths regarding both ethics and aesthetics. If I care deeply about art, care deeply about what art does and what it affects in my being and hopefully in other others' beings, and that's related to my sense of what's good, what's worthwhile, what's deep, what's really meaningful, what's really important in life. And then it's often the case then that I harbour, even though if I conceal it a little bit from others, a view that tends towards more the the notion of the independent existence of truths about both what is ethical and, uh, in the sense of meaningful and w- what constitutes a life worth living, and also what's of value aesthetically. So... Personally, and I've said this before, I cannot agree that you know the collected works of John Coltrane are equal in value to the collected works of the Smurfs, or even the collected works of Brittany Spears or, or whatever. I, I just can't. I just can't agree. Really, if I'm honest. I can't agree. In in that they they you know to me there's there's a whole different order of value aesthetic value, which touches on spiritual value, which touches on ethics. And what I want John Coltrane, when, when I hear his music, when I'm open to his music, what it does to me, what, you know, what it can do to me, is totally related, and my sense of existence, my sense of soul, is totally related to my sense of what makes life worth living, and my sense of God, and my sense of dimensionality. The ethics and the aesthetics are connected here if I care deeply about art and I I tend towards a kind of more realist uh, view of independent existence of value there I, I really cannot agree if you're going to say yeah, the Smurfs are just as valuable as John Coltrane but it's, it's complex because um, there's also a kind of <clears throat> it seems, I don't know, I'm not really sure about all this, uh, there seems to be also a kind of taboo more widely about asserting the independent, an independent truth um, regarding the aesthetic worth for some something that's non-classical. I mean, you get sometimes immature, oh, that's shit, that's shit. Whatever. And usually it's just because someone's unfamiliar with some form or some kind of new contemporary music or contemporary art. But usually the person that says that, uh, art is not that important to them. You know, it's just shit. It's not, it's not coming from a place where art is actually really important to them. It's something that they spend a lot of time opening themselves to and resonating with and feeling. And uh, It's just that something's unfamiliar, so they just say it's shit. They're not trained in a way. So I don't know. Maths, is that, if, if, sorry, maths, ethics, in both senses, in the sense, in the wider sense that we've been trying to open up here, what makes life worthwhile? What makes life really meaningful? What's a life worth living? What is the beautiful life? What is really good that I should aspire to? And in the smaller sense of right and wrong, and as aesthetics, the value in art. 
or a part of aesthetics, the question of value in art and whether that has independent objective existence. There's a kind of, I don't know, it's confusing when you look at the culture and where we are in the culture with these things. Why am I bringing this up? Partly just because of the interesting connection um, in ontology between, we talked about maths in the realm of ideas and ideational and imaginal and values. We've talked about ethics, uh, ontology, and, uh, and then corresponding ontologies of beauty. But also, I'm also bringing it up, so to me that's just interesting, but I'm also bringing up the cultural question of where we are, where we tend to be, our society, the kind of views that are prevalent around all that. Because soul-making dharma is born now, at this time, in our culture. And so it's born into a set of, uh, or, or a soup, really, of ontological and epistemological views and beliefs and uh, questions and possibilities, but also unquestioned assumptions and rigidities and all kinds of things. So it's quite interesting and relevant to also reflect uh, or, to, or kind of get a sense of where the, cult, where the culture is on these um, questions of ontology and epistemology with regard to uh, different domains, maths, ethical domains in two senses, and, and aesthetics. Because mm. it may be that someone listening to all this, or someone listening to even previous talks before the ethics, thinks, well, pff, all this soul-making dharma business and soul-making practice, it's, it's a bit elitist, isn't it? I mean, you have to have done all this other practice and understand this, and you're talking about all this sophisticated um, philosophy and psychology and dharma understanding, and isn't that all a bit elitist? Uh, and there's a certain kind of reaction in relationship to that. Uh, it can be from, from you know, born in our culture. And then we say, well, if you're trying to propose a soul-making dharma approach to ethics, then that's, that's really elitist. You're expecting uh, too much from people. Only, only a very elite few would be able to do that. So, well, it's interesting. You think, okay, well, if that's the case, why is it not like math- ma- mathematics, where you would um, give the ethical questions to experts, elite, those who are trained, or train yourself? And, and, you know, epistemologically speaking, giving something to an expert or relying on an expert opinion, as I pointed out, uh, I don't know, some, some time or other in a talk, that's a kind of epistemology as well. We do that all the time with science. Uh, we do that with medicine. You know, if the doctor tells me, yeah, your cancer has come back, how do you know? Well, I, this and this and this, the blood tests and the... Um, or whatever... This is the probable prognosis. I'm relying on the expert opinion, and we do that all the time in, in, in lots of fields, pr- primarily medicine and science, but as I said, also classical art and classical literature. You just say, oh, so-and-so says, this is good, so, yeah, probably is good. But what, what about doing that with ethics? If we think it's... Uh, Beliefs is not that simple. We acknowledge, as I said, for maths and for aesthetics, that there are experts, and um, they've probably had a long and difficult training that's necessary to reach that level of expertise, and maybe uh, they they had some innate talent or dispositional propensity to that area. And we give those uh, questions and those issues to them. Well, one of the reasons we don't do that with ethics as well is because it it affects it is going to affect my life and my choices much more directly, it seems, than 
uh, questions of aesthetics or mathematics. I can't avoid it like I can avoid mathematics and I can even avoid art to a certain extent. I mean, soul making is not, soul making practice is not something anyone else can really do for you anyway. It's your personal practice. But maybe, you know, politically speaking, socially speaking, in, in, in issues and matters that affect everyone. So, for example, you know, Heathrow expansion, or they're talking about this HS2 rail line, high speed rail line linking the south and the north of England. Um, supposedly to, you know, more equalize the relative wealth and economic growth in, in the north and south, where it hasn't been equal so far. Uh, but while they're, or in the process of even beginning to build this HS2 railway line, high-speed railway line, it's decimating... Um, but, uh, you know, um, ecological reserves and um, na- nature reserves, etc. Some with endangered species and all kinds of things, felling lots of trees, etc. Or as I said, Heathrow expansion. These kinds of issues that affect, will affect a lot of people, or maybe even everyone. Is, is democracy the best way of deciding? I touched on this, I think, in the Cedar and Soul talk. Maybe, maybe not anymore. I don't know. In a world of equal democracy, but there's Facebook and Google and who knows who tracking my preferences and opinions online and then um, feeding me it, both information and uh, marketing uh, according to uh, my my in line with my uh, history and my propensities, and not um, not opening me to, up to other views. On top of which, there's the spreading of fake news. There's Russian cyber influence, and who knows else. There's the whole unrestrained global ca- capitalist market global market capitalism and advertising in a way promoting sometimes the lowest common denominator of desires and even like deciding what's on TV you know how how much or, or, or whatever how much does that come from a kind of uh, democratic process and, and is it necessary to be trusted for lots of reasons, and partly because, you know, in ethical terms, because we, as I said through this talk, five parts or whatever it is now, that we've kind of lost the ground for ethical thinking and ethical discernment. And certainly we've lost the ground, lost even the, the question and the space in the larger sense of ethics, I mean, about really what's a worthwhile life, what's good, what's beautiful, what is a beautiful life. We've just lost that. And so to hand it to the people and to a supposedly equal democratic process, is that really the best thing anymore? I don't know. It's obviously a really tricky question. I mean, if everyone were trained in sensing the soul and educated in virtue ethics, uh, uh, you know, approaching the soul that way, then, then democracy and these decisions, as much as... Uh, these decisions that do, uh, or, or rather that the question of what is worthwhile, what is beautiful, what is really important, what makes a life worth living, they do bear on these these kind of political, social, economic questions. So if everyone was trained in opening up that sense and, and trained in discerning, then democracy would be a very different thing. You know, Plato's Republic is uh, one of his sort of, uh, major texts. 
he talks he talks in this ideal society has a kind of spiritual elite, sort of they're specially trained and dedicated, and they're they they do make decisions. And this is really you know dangerous territory um, for Western culture, Western society, a dangerous idea, a difficult idea, a repugnant idea for most people to entertain the idea of a spiritual elite again. But you know. Is democracy really in such a healthy place anymore? Again, for lots of different reasons. I'm not. I'm not sure what the answers are, but yes, you know, in Plato's Republic, which actually just reads as a kind of fantasy novel, sort of a utopian op- opposite of sort of George Orwell. There's a spiritual elite that that maybe educate and dictate a hierarchy of moral purposes. But again, what would it be if that was that hierarchy was um, related to sensing the soul and not to uh, this thing or that thing, uh, the activity in itself? Tricky. I mean, just to say as well, it's not as if we don't have elites uh, in our democracy or running our democracies, you know, the ultra-rich... 13, 13 men are as wealthy as something like 50% of, of women in the in the third world. Or I, I can't remember, but anyway. Ultra-rich and corporations uh, deciding laws and policies as if that's in a democracy and it, it already goes on. Or, you know, political leaders, Trump and Putin and even Boris Johnson, who are very willing and actually able to override, override or disregard or even override democratic processes. So yes, we have this ideal of democracy, but it's also like, hmm, it's, it's sagging at best and it's got some holes in it. So I don't know what the answers to all this are at all. And yeah, it's a kind of the idea of a spiritual elite is, is, you know, uh, not repugnant, but alarming to me also. But who do you want in power? It's not as if there isn't uh, elites running things at the moment. So, I don't know. These are just questions, as I said, opening up territory, which is more inconclusive than conclusive, but It would be wonderful if we were all taught, trained to develop uh, practice, if not soul making, there was some other practice that helped us discern and navigate and relate to and really be alive to and sensitive to the questions within this much larger uh, issue, a much larger notion of ethics. What is the beautiful life? What makes a life beautiful? What is really worthwhile? In what uh, can I anchor my ethics? What other what sense of another dimension can I ground my ethics in? My sense of what's uh, not just right or wrong, but my sense also of what's worthwhile and beautiful. It would be wonderful if we were all trained to develop practices like that, soul making dharma practice, or or something akin to that, that helps us um, in that territory, in that domain, helps the soul, helps the mind and the heart to be sensitive, to be navigate, to to navigate, to have a, uh, a compass. Just as we are, most of us, or the ideal in Western societies, that everyone is trained to some degree in mathematics, in reading and writing, to some degree in logic, now even computer skills, part of the normal education at school, and, you know, teaching mindfulness meditation in schools. So, part of me thinks, oh, it's just a, you know, complete pipe dream that society would ever get to a place where 
this, th these kinds of practices and these kinds of tools and approaches and this kind of way of thinking. It's not to have to be exactly soul making now, but something akin that really allows uh, our, our beings to to um, bring our our sensitivity and our discernment and our deep soul and our deep intelligence to bear on this domain, on the, in this domain, on these questions. Partly, I think that's a complete pipe pipe dream, and yet we have these other trainings that it really took a while to kind of establish as norms. I don't know if the mindfulness in schools is yet a norm, but it, it may well be soon. I don't know. So, who knows? Maybe it's not such a pipe dream. And maybe, anyway, we don't have to wait for the whole culture to adopt something, to be established in a whole culture. We can start ourselves. And obviously, for ourselves, we can find out for ourselves what does this do to my image of ethics? What does it do then to my sense of existence and my sense of navigating choices in life, and responding to uh, ethical situations, responding to social, political, economic issues, environmental issues? What does it do to my whole sense of of myself and my life and the possibilities of my life. Thank you for listening. To learn how you can support the teachers and Dharma Seed, please visit dharmaseed.org slash donate.